Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Executive Editor of Dataversity. We'd like to thank you for joining the first installment of the new Dataversity webinar series, Data Insights and Analytics, brought to you in partnership with First San Francisco Partners. To kick us off, uh, to kick off the series, John and Kelly will discuss the series namesake and talk about data insights and analytics frameworks. And just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Or if you like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag DI Analytics. As always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of this session, and additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now let me introduce our speakers for today. Well-known industry analyst John Ladley is a business technology thought leader and recognized authority in all aspects of the enterprise information management. With 30 years experience in planning, project management, improving IT organizations, and successful implementation of information systems. He is the President and Chief Delivery Officer at First San Francisco Partners. Also joining us is Kelly O'Neill. Kelly is the founder and CEO of First San Francisco Partners, having worked with the software and systems providers key to the formulation of enterprise information management. Kelly has played an important role in many of the groundbreaking initiatives that confirm the value of EIM to the enterprise. Recognizing an unmet need for clear guidance and advice on the intricacies of implementing EIM solutions, she founded First San Francisco Partners in early 2007. And with that, I will turn it over to John and Kelly to get today's webinar started. Hello and welcome. Well, good uh, morning, afternoon, evening. Everyone who's listening, this is John and the other voice you're about to hear is Kelly or better be. Good morning and happy new year or hello and happy new year. It might not be morning. <laughs> yes. And it might be warm or cold. It's uh, minus right. eight Celsius where I'm sitting right now um, and I'm hopefully it's warmer for some of you. Uh, anyway, uh, but I'm not outside, I'm inside. So anyway, let's uh, get going with our topic here uh, today. And first, uh, Kelly and I are going to talk about just welcoming you to the new to new series. Um, data insights and analytics is a uh, hot topic, I guess, is one way to talk about it. Our prior series on CDOs uh, um, uh, actually inspired this because most chief data officer work is uh, around this area um, and uh, it's an important topic right now. So we're looking to grow uh, your understanding of this um, and that means not just the big data and analytics but also maybe some of that mundane stuff like BI and reporting and, and data warehouse. Uh, the key here is you get value from this discipline. And uh, it is not always an easy process. So we want to get past all of the, the, the hype and, and uh, techno speak and, and, and help you get uh, results. That's really what this series uh, is, is about. Uh, if you hear anything that you want changed or would like to see in the future, please check with the abstracts that are out there with Dataversity or Use the Q&A facility here to, uh, to uh, um, uh, uh, send us some ideas besides your questions that, that we are going to, to answer. Kelly, um, add some stuff to that. Yeah, you know, we found that the engagement uh, last year, especially, boy, the last one at the end of the year, there was so much engagement and questions that we're going to try very hard to leave enough time within each of these webinars to be able to, to address your questions and answers. So all of that is very valuable. We appreciate it, and we will do our best to make sure that we're accommodating it. Very good. So without further ado, then, let's just kind of get started. Today, we're going to talk about what is a framework, what is an architecture. There, there's kind of a difference, and we feel that's important uh, for you to understand. One, you can uh, speak pretty clearly towards one audience and the other one you can speak clearly towards other uh, audiences. And then as a way of example, we're going to dive into a few representations of those uh, architectures, the, the, the uh, classic big data, uh, the word sandbox or lab is extremely uh, popular these days. Uh, Real-time analytics, not a new concept. Sorry if someone thinks it is. It's been around a while, but we'll talk about that. And then um, uh, we're going to take a look at some of the old-fashioned stuff just by way of balance. And hopefully you have some things to take away from, 
from the conversation, and as Kelly said, we really do want to answer your questions or hear what's on your mind. Anything, Kelly? Nope. All right. <laughs> All right. I saw you were muted. I didn't know whether you were talking to the mute or, or not. All right. So, yeah, exactly. Good question, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, well, we're going to talk together. On these next flu, uh, flu sides, <laughs> flu sides, few first of the year. I uh, give me a break. All right, um, uh, a framework is really uh, how you deliver and get value out of something. Uh, what does the architecture do for you? What are its pieces and parts? And that might even include an organization model. Um, we want the, the we want to show holistic thinking with frameworks and and architectures, um, uh, but you know there, there's an awful lot of uh, talk about maturity, right, Kelly, out there in the market, and where where do you fit? And there's this uh, continuum of you know delivering data to operate your business versus the super sophisticated predictive analytics. And I suppose next year we'll add a bubble for artificial intelligence or machine learning or something out there. Uh, but that's not necessarily a, a, a hard and fast continuum, is it? No, I mean, absolutely. I think the, the business requirement is across all of the levels of maturity. I think that these are just different types of analytics and consumption of data. Some are more sophisticated in their approach and require more effort, more cost, more uh, um I guess, future and bleeding edge thinking, but operational reporting is still quite important. Yeah. And no, keep going. Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, 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 no go no. ahead. <laughs> no, well, I would say we, we, we very often run into a client or a, or, or a prospect or we just talk to somebody at a, at a conference and, and um, um, they'll have the predictive analytics group off in one part of the organization and they're doing fabulous things. A thousand points of light are coming out of the data scientist, and in the other end of the organization, they can't get an operational report accurate and get anyone to agree on the results. Well, does that mean that they failed? They haven't, you know, sequenced up the continuum. They're, you know, no. Their 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 framework for doing this is going to have to allow for that. It's going to have to allow for some operational things as well as getting value. The, the key here, right, Kelly, is get value out of your data assets. And, and this is where it happens. This is this is the consumption end of, of of your architecture. Absolutely, and that's also why we talked about this as data insights and analytics, because uh, it's not just about analytics, or at least in context of this webinar, the topics and the things that we think about are not just analytics, because there's data insights that can occur across this continuum, and the data preparation process. Uh, there's a level, there's certain amounts of efficiencies and economies of scale when you're looking at data preparation, even for something that is very uh, forward thinking around um, predictive analytics and taking advantage of NLP and, and you know, all of that. But if the data is not prepared in a consistent way, then you're not going to actually get the business value that you're wanting out of these different sorts of levels of maturity. So it is important that we're still considering the data components of this, not just the analytics. Yeah, a a absolutely. So uh, so if you're sitting there with your head in your hands going, you know, how can we possibly be spending money on big data when, um, you know, we don't know how many widgets are out in the warehouse? Um, that's okay. You're you're among friends, and it's okay. You just need to, to start to address both ends uh, uh, at the same time. Um, so here's a, here's a common uh, typical framework. Uh, the, it's one we use often. Um, and uh, so you have data insights. And of course, you have to wrap this governance around this, right? You have to wrap governance around it. You have to have alignment with your organization. You have to be culturally ready. And you have to have the oversight of the data. This is a common theme you heard from us last year. We're not going to change and we're not going to back off either. Um, it is really, really important. Um, uh, there is an operating model somewhere along that spectrum that we just talked about. You have to do business, and that act of doing business has to interact with how that data is used in the business. 
then there's all these components that we like to kick around and talk about. You know, sadly, we all go to the to the middle of this first. You know, what's the architecture look like, and what's the you know data quality, and and who gets it, when do they get it, is it push or is it pull, um, and what does it look like? We need sexy presentation, we need visualization. You know, I, I got to have this tool. Um, a lot of time is spent on data wrangling, which is uh, I I think that's my favorite term of the year so far. Now it is only the the sixth, but it's my favorite term. It's fifth of the year so far. Um, it is just all the movement and, and, and heavy and light lifting of data. And then, of course, our, our old friend, metadata, um, sitting on a big pile of technology of various shapes and forms. But this is, this is something you can take to anyone in the organization, right? Okay. Um, so then, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, and then I was just talking into my mute button, by the way. <laughs> yeah, and uh, <laughs> and so, you know, I think that, that again, like we, uh, as you said, John, a lot of times we jump to the, the the capabilities that are in that those yellow boxes. And we will talk quite a bit about those different capabilities across the year, but let's not forget that this does need to be in the context of a business strategy. Your business strategy and your data insights and analytics strategy need to be aligned. So that's why we've got this concept of organizational alignment, and that takes into consideration things like organizational change management. Um, because as uh, the, the analytics world continues to progress at an absolutely dynamic and rapid pace, uh, the data world needs to progress at a rapid pace as well, which means that you are impacting the way that people behave in their jobs across the organization within IT, uh, within an administrative and kind of data maintenance organization, within your traditional data management organization, and then the way that you interact with some of the uh, analytics and data science organizations. Maybe there's a big change to your organization just by nature of having new titles and new roles that are things like data scientists and that sort of thing. So there is a, a big component around recognizing the need for organizational alignment and organizational change. So I think if we think about the concept of the framework, the framework guides decision making, as, as John said in the previous slide. So what are the types of decisions that need to be made in each of these categories? And how does that impact my organization or my plan or my strategy? Cool. So that's how we think about using that framework. And, and, then, and then the next thing, of course, the architecture, and everyone's familiar uh, with, you know, the CAN slide, I call it. Um, and we've done a very simple one to just kind of hold our thoughts together for this for, for this conversation today. And, and, and it's probably not all that atypical. You know, we have data sources and we have some data movement and one or in part of the organization, it could go into your data warehouse, ODS data, you know, mark type um, uh, aspect and another part or even part of uh, 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 a planned architecture, there's the ingestion into the big data environment with the lake and the sandbox and, and that kind of uh, things. And of course, we surround it with our governance and, and operations management, data quality and controls and all those things. So this is, this is, you know, this is when you start to get into flow and direction and where things live and where, where it sits and all of that, or the layers. If you're into a service-oriented type world, you know, or, or you know, a multiple-layer type thing, that this is where it goes to. We have an asterisk there. We want to talk about real time today, but that little asterisk there means that real time stuff is is can be everywhere. Um, uh, 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 you know, low latency data uh, usage is just as important as as high latency data usage. So we're putting that everywhere. Um, and so that we're going to talk about in the you know in the perspective of this architecture. Uh, uh, the rest of the uh, for the rest of this conversation. Um, so without a further ado, Kelly, if anything to add, we'll just dive in here. Uh, I, all I would say is knowing that we have uh, probably some very deep technologists on the call, we have uh, decidedly kept this uh, at a high level as our first webinar of the year, and we will continue both within this presentation to drill down into the cans, if you will, uh, as well as as we go on through the year. So just uh, recognizing that we're trying to keep to uh, drill down over time, both within the webinar as well as within the webinar series. Yeah, we're going to – this will evolve. We, we've, we've got the real hairy-looking one in, you know, in the file. Uh, you'll see it. But we just – for the sake of today, let's start with this. So let's just talk about these four areas we're going to talk about. There's a lot more to this conversation inside in analytics than just the big data stack. 
Uh, that's one thing to bear in mind. This entire architecture we showed you has relevance. Um, I, I know there's someone out there that says everything can go in the lake and our problems are solved. That is not correct. Um, nor is it uh, economical. So, so that, you know, so that's the one thing we, there's more to it than just the stack. The other thing is, uh, that has changed is at one time we were very linear with this, with this stuff. We kind of, you know, the old, the old, uh, picture that goes from left to right, I call it the bow tie. Right, Kelly? It's, 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 it's what we saw this for years and years and it's the bunch of disc symbols on the left mm -hmm. and then, and then some magic happens in the middle and all the consumers are on the right and it kind of gets narrow in the middle to the warehouse and explodes to the right again. It looks like a bow tie. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's just, that's just the solution to the spaghetti diagram. Yes, that's it. The mm -hmm. solution to the spaghetti diagram. And it's, it's linear. It's kind of a left to right or top to bottom or bottom to top. And what we're doing now is a lot less linear. There's a lot more going on. And if you add services to it and things, you know, and, and instead of a flow uh, along pipelines, you might have some uh, service bus or something like that. But the fact is that, that, that we are really changing a lot in that area. So that is a big, big difference. But that, but that doesn't mean some of these old structures go away. It just means maybe you supply them differently. So we're going to cover some of them. Um, the, the, the bottom line is that these are all these things are arranged by a series of characteristics of latency or access or the, what the value is, who they're exposed to, the, you know, the velocity, the volume, and, you know, with a capacity to just move things through the pipe. And, and that's really what's going to set the tone for you here. So we're going to look into standard big data and some of those characteristics, the sandbox, a real time thing, and then what we would call the heritage type, uh, thing. Cause heritage sounds really classy, whereas old, sounds old. So we're not going to talk about, we're not going to talk uh, uh, like that. So I'm um, uh, going to move forward here unless anything to add, Kelly? Nope, I'm good. All righty. Um, so big data. Um, we have a very elementary uh, 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 architecture or framework there on the right for big data. And you've got your, your sources, uh, what is called ingestion, um, a structuring a layer because when you ingest into, you don't necessarily uh, put things into a type of, of file system. They're not connected together in the big data world, like maybe they might be in a more relational world. Uh, and then we have, of course, everyone using this stuff. And we have our old friend metadata on the bottom there to monitor and the technical and the, the, the semantical or the definitional type stuff. And, and those are your basic uh, components. Now, those are kind of new components compared to uh, history here. Um, but, with, you know, in the area of concern, well, I mean, obviously, this is well-established technology. Now, we can't say this is the next big thing. It is here. It's rocking and rolling. Um, but, you know, we do notice a couple of real high-priority areas and some real gaps in, in, in organizations, and we'll call those to your attention today. And the rest of the year, we're going to dwell into them. Um, Metadata. There is the technical and the business part, but but you know that's 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 the tip of the iceberg. Lineage, meaning, interpretation of it. The 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 real issue here is only recently, only recently have we begun to see solid tools to help address the total lack of metadata in say a traditional Hadoop, you know, MapReduce uh, type uh, environment. There's a lot of folks that think schema on read is perfectly fine. Eh, that only works to a point. So um, uh, metadata is a high concern here. Also security, privacy. Um, uh, we're kind of keeping a tally sheet here, uh, Kelly and I, and with our folks, and and we've got a, a really nice handful of folks that have uh, found um, personally uh, personal information and information that needed to be secured has found its way into a sandbox or a big data environment. So you still need to to do that, you might also have contractual agreements with the data you're pulling in from the outside that you don't know about, and and you really need to uh, consider those. Um, our old friend data governance is always there, but it's oversight of the lineage, oversight of the quality, and oversight of semantics. Now, it's not maybe the same data quality we would have in MDM. It might just it might have a much broader tolerance for variance. Um, I think you know I think Kelly, what we're saying here is that. The data scientists cannot squeeze all of the quality issues out of the big data because of sheer volume. That is only relevant in a few kinds of models. Uh, the other rest of the time, you know, you're probably going to have to think about is this stuff really usable the way you're finding it. Um, and then lastly, latency. 
uh, the access, the usage, some physical type things. Is how are you going to get to it? How long is it going to be sitting out there? Uh, and what type of structure do you want to set this in? Um, the key thing here about big data, and we'll, we'll hit the difference here with the sandbox, is this is persistent data. Uh, this is going to sit out there, and, and it's got all the risks and rewards that comes with data just kind of hanging around out there. Yeah, the only other thing I would add is as technology continues to advance, so does our uh, um, compliance and regulatory environment, and so do our beliefs around appropriate use of data and uh, companies' own internal culture and policy around what is appropriate and what's not appropriate. So uh, just because the technology can do something doesn't mean that it's necessarily correct, legally um, correct, or even appropriate to do something. And so then when we talk about these high priority concerns, it's keeping in mind what boundaries you want to put around that data to make sure that it is fit for use, right? That's an old term we use for quality for, you know, probably decades now, right? Um, but is it fit for use? And, and are we structuring the uh, access and the uh, consumption of the data appropriately? Sometimes it becomes a sort of uh, chicken and egg process where if we don't understand the data, we can't actually ensure that it adheres to our security and privacy standards around permissions and policy and contractual arrangements, yep. et cetera. So, uh, but I think that that's something to keep in mind as we look at um, the trending in capability from a technology perspective and how do we make sure that we're still getting insights from the appropriate use of that technology. And, you know, in, a few, in future uh, webinars this year, we are, we are going to dive deeper into where some of these attitudes and things manifest themselves. We talk about data scientists and, and, and data quality and, 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 and the differences in, in usage dictate uh, these things, and, and, and there's some organizations where they're not recognizing that. So we're going to dive deeper into some of those, those uh, finer points around that. Um, here, it's a use case just uh, to somebody who's kind of new to this on on the phone. Um, we've got a few examples in here for you where, you know, we have a, a telecommunications company with, you know, the, the typical telecommunications, you know, uh, 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 thousands of terabytes upon thousands of terabytes of data, but uh, cross-referencing across 500 uh, data elements. Elephants, elements. <laughs> so you're just yeah. thinking Hadoop, right? <laughs> I just, yeah, I did silly little stuffed element. Uh, stuffed element. I am just totally uh, got my merge mixed up here. Um, and they identify churn, and they've had you know a really good you know. And this is really what's cool about big data is is back in the old days with data warehouse, it took us a long time to find the, those little points of light, and we're finding those points of light a lot sooner. And that is a wonderful, wonderful thing. But, you know, there is a dark side to that. We'll get to that in another, another webinar. But we are, you know, seeing that the power of data is becoming recognized, and that's helping spread to other parts of, of the organization. Uh, let's move on to the next one, because I obviously can't read that one. Um, uh, let's see here. So the sandbox, um, the components are similar. But, you know, a sandbox is by definition, what do you, I mean, what's the mental impression with a sandbox or a lab is you can experiment, you can play around. Um, you know, being standalone, is, but a sandbox does not have to be big data. We have the big data part represented on the top with our ingestion and, and an analytics thing. But there's also, you can just have a standalone bunch of stuff and good old SaaS and just bang on it. And that's perfectly fine. They tend to be very batch because you're going to load stuff and, and, and uh, play with it. Uh, and and then uh, um, you know and and the people using it are, are going to be an analyst or a data scientist. This is not something that you put out for broad uh, access or or productionize. I think the key there is if if you start to use it all the time, then you need to productionize it. So the high priority concerns here are as the data goes in, do you understand what it really is? You know, going out and finding stuff. Uh, and now data scientists love this exercise, but you have to still do it. Then you have to, regardless of, 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 of where you're getting it, you have to make it usable or standardized in some sort of way. Um, uh, and then you can go ahead and, and play around. So it's not just grab everything and throw it in. Close, but not quite. Um, with the security and privacy, because you're putting in raw data, 
um, that implies no controls. Now, and by the way, when I say raw, I don't mean the granular. Raw data could be have some level of non-granularity to it, but but it's coming in pretty loosey goosey. And um, you want, don't want to control the environment. You want people to have fun experimenting with it, but you do want to, uh, you know, for example, don't expose personal information if it's there and if you think there's a risk of doing that. And you know, you have to be careful about that. And with metadata. Uh, another kind of word for lineage here and, and maybe a more sophisticated view beyond lineage is the provenance and pedigree. You know, do you know where you're getting it and you know where it came from and you know what the possible uses of it are? And that allows you actually to, to build some tolerances into your, into your work. And from our performance characteristics, again, non-persistent, non-production. If it's production, it's not a sandbox. Okay. Uh, there's, uh, you gotta be careful with that. It is self-service. Uh, um, just, you know, there it is, folks. Have at it. Um, they're not going to be uh, 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 some production environment to wrap around it. Um, and the other thing we found out, and this is a funny one, uh, and Kelly and I and uh, Malcolm, we've chatted about this uh, recently. These things get dirty really fast. I mean, you know, like my room when I was a teenager. We're talking, you can't find anything. Um, and then it's not useful anymore. So there is a certain amount of housekeeping. Uh, to go with these. Uh, additional insight from you, Kelly, here on this one? Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, one of the things that, that might seem to be a bit contradictory in this slide is we talk about the uh, consumption components as being data scientists and data analysts uh, only, but in, then at the same time, um, we uh, just talked about self-service. And I think that over time, that's going to change slightly in the sense that Self-service right now applies to data scientists and data analysts, but as most of you have heard about the concept of the citizen data scientist and how there's this drive to free the information. We've got several clients uh, now, believe it or not, even within financial services that are talking about data freedom within their organization where it's self-service all over the place. So. I brought this up here versus in the, in the previous slide because sandbox are the first places where people really want to be able to uh, access and play around kind of at any time. But that trend will become broader and deeper and people are going to want to have more access to the data, which means we need to consider those concerns around uh, data discovery, understanding, standardization, et cetera. So I don't need to reread those bullet points, but we do uh, need to consider that this is not going, that um, the idea of a sandbox and the idea of self-service uh, may start to come into conflict uh, even over the course of this year, as a matter of fact. Yep. All right. Um, the use case we have here is, is uh, predictive maintenance, which is uh, near and dear to my heart. That's where I cut my teeth in BI many, many years ago. Um, where uh, uh, someone has collected uh, a bunch of sensor data from machinery um, and machinery that has um, some, some very rigorous maintenance requirements. And they've saved themselves an awful lot of time and money by uh, being able to uh, predict parts failures um, uh, using a sandbox, using the modern approaches. They've been able to take what a grinding exercise, which might have taken six months to analyze, you know, time between part failures and stuff into, you know, only a few weeks, which saves an awful lot of money, obviously, in uptime and 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 things like that. So uh, again, another example, and and again, there's there's many many good examples of of, of value of this type of technology. Uh, when we go to the real time, and so oh, by the way, I see some questions are coming in. I see one right now that I'm going to jump on as soon as we're done. Um, uh, I'm going to jump on it in a good way. Sorry, let me just don't don't miss it. Don't misinterpret that. It's a very good question and it's very relevant. I want to, we'll hit that one. And don't forget, please ask questions if you want to ask uh, questions. Um, uh, the components for real time, very similar, except we've got to stream it in there. We've got, to, we've got a lower latency for the inbound side and uh, we've got a fair way to stream it. Um, uh, but we can do real time in a data warehouse. We can do real time in an operational data store too. We can do real time in different ways. It doesn't necessarily have to be the big data technology environment. The, a lot of the concerns are the same. How fast can you get it in? Does the pipe handle it? Um, uh, once it's in there, uh, do you need to tell anybody what the results are? Do you have some messaging things? 
um, uh, uh, you know, do you need the in-memory type thing for the low latencies and things like that? Uh, security and privacy, same thing you're going to have with anything real time. Um, uh, if, if it's, if it's going to be a problem to do something real time and have someone looking at it right away, you know, you know, ad ad address it. Uh, governance, again, we're going to look at metadata and compliance to make sure that all this fast moving stuff is being treated, uh, in compliance. Um, and from from the from the whole standpoint of of latency and and real time, uh, getting it out is really really important. So you're going to have to have good analytical facilities. Uh, these types of structures will generate messages or agents or their own series of events, probably. And and uh, if you're not used to that, I, I call that closing the loop. And if you're not used to that, you're going to have you know you have to get used to the process aspect of that. Um, these are very flexible structures and, again, very low latency, very high high performance things. Kelly, anything on your, your side? Uh, no, I'm, I'm wondering, though, so sorry, I, I know that you were looking at some of the questions that were coming in here that might be appropriate to answer at this, at this juncture, so maybe I'll read it out to you. Okay. Um, and, by the way, thank you for... Uh, putting in the questions. So I'm not sure that I agree with your depiction of how information flows between ETL, EDW, and big data. Looks like you're still looking at the information in the old traditional way. Can you please comment? Yeah, that's the one I wanted to answer. I'm happy to tackle that now. Um, what we showed you is a sample architecture. Um, but that begs another question. That is actually, you know, a, a reduction of an architecture that currently works for uh, a company that that I've worked with, um, and the question that begs is: Is there a right way or a wrong way? And the answer to that is no. The traditional way data moves might be okay for a company, um, uh, um, and so that architecture is uh, the architectures aren't right or wrong. So I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm going to uh, I'm, I'm gonna disagree with the implication in the question that there is a right way or a wrong way. It is the the right way. Is the one that works for your organization. So if if the data flows traditionally for some reason, because that's what the pipes can work or it works, then then you need to be open to doing it a certain different way. Um, uh, uh, there's a lot of people entering the business now that don't remember um, a period of time when we started to really build larger data sets back in the late late 80s and early 90s, and that was uh, what we, you know, the war between a dimensional model and the normalized model and the denormalized data models. And everyone would ask me, what one should I have? And the answer is, I don't know. What does your business need? So there is no right way or a wrong way. So if, if you have a context that you don't agree with how this flows, then, you know, your context is of a different organization. But that doesn't mean that what this, this, particular example, and by the way, it's a very high level sample, right, that it, that it shows. And I, so I, that's the, the question that it begs is, is there a right way or wrong way? The answer to that to me is no, uh, although we weren't trying to show any way in this picture, but it does, it does, you know, and, and thank you again for that question, because it's something that, that we see all the time. You know, am I doing this the right way? Is there a reference architecture for my industry? There's one we can start with. But we're going. To, you're going to have to put some science and some engineering on this. Kelly, you want to add to that at all, or move on to another one? No, I, I think all, that's I great. All, I can yeah, go all no, day on that one. <laughs> yeah, and I think that we'll talk about it in a couple of slides. I think we'll talk about it uh, again. Yeah. So I think. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. Um, so uh, real-time analytics. This is a. Uh, this is a probably a more well-known example. Uh, using social media, news reports, everything feeding into. Uh, um, uh, 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 a group that was monitoring this and the recent outbreak of Ebola um, was before, uh, um, um, you know, the, the right people to deal with it were notified a lot sooner than they typically were notified before. And it really helped contain that. And this is a classic example of real time because real time media feeds Nose reports, social networks, everything's re are being gathered by uh, organizations that monitor diseases around the world, and this stuff's being done in real time, and 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 actions we're taking. But you know, look at the benefit where the benefits came from. They knew how to act. 
It wasn't just putting the stuff in there and some result comes out. It's what do you do with the result? What, what follows after uh, the result? And this is a really, really good example of, of the benefit of real-time an analytics. Um, so here's our, our uh, that's time to go into the, um, I'm just going to check the questions here real quick, see if we have another one here. Um, uh, Kelly, do we see here? Uh, um, a couple more, but we can catch them uh, uh, towards the end. Um, so le legacy structures, we they still have relevance. Um, we still do reports, right? We still have business intelligence, right? We still have um, hundreds and thousands of departmental business analysts doing things that affect the ebb and flow of business just as much as the result from a sophisticated model is going to affect the ebb and flow of business. The components have very familiar names like ETL, data warehouse, operational data store, and they're still relevant because there's a lot of aspects of big data that is not relevant to them. And that's the old volume, velocity, veracity type things. If they're not there, you know, just because you can doesn't mean you should. Uh, you need to be open-minded to those types of things. We've come across several folks that feel that everything must be in a data lake and then somehow that will be made a broad spectrum uh, structure that meets all the needs. And maybe it can work, and again, maybe it can't, but you need to put some thought into it. The concerns we still have these days with ETL is, is you know, is the pipeline big enough? Because more and more data is getting moved, and your old heavy lifting ETL batch stuff sometimes just can't carry the mail. Um, so you might have another high speed uh, thing or parallelize uh, ETL things. Also, a lot of organizations are invoking service oriented architectures, which means they want to move their data or use services as much as they can. Well, services have a limit. They will stop working or, well, no, they won't stop working, but the performance won't be adequate at a certain point in time. Um, but if you do have services, um, build a data layer. Don't just put a, just don't do another business process service. Build data services so everybody can share in the delight of service oriented architectures. Um, uh, you have to understand that, you know, um, uh, Kelly, we, we run into this. We've, we've, we did a few things last year where this was really important to clients, departmental use of things, you know, historical reporting. Uh, I didn't put it up there, but regulatory reporting, operational ad hoc. These are still really, really important things. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, don't shove this stuff off into the corner as old stuff. It's still really, really important. The reason these are really relevant is you've still got var variant latency, variant historical requirements, variant operational requirements, lots of moving parts, lots of different characteristics that mean you need to be a little more flexible with things other than just one type of of structure. Um, so we need to we need to consider that. Kelly, anything that you would uh, uh, want to um, uh, add uh, to that one before we're getting uh, we're getting up the question time here. That's pretty cool. Yeah, I think one thing that I just wanted to add is that. Uh, and I, and I can't remember if we had put in a um, use case for this one or not. And I was trying to go back to our draft of slides. John, do we have a use case? We Great. do. I'll tell you what. Let's go through the use case, and then I'm going to comment. Oh, uh, the, the, the floor is yours. Why don't you uh, – I'll just go through the use case here, and then um, we're, we're good to go. So uh, healthcare, um, big hospital. Um, and they built what they call a data warehouse. And it is a data warehouse because in terms of the way it's loaded uh, and uh, the velocity of the data, um, it, it, it's not big data. Um, but they're still using a predictive models against it and artificial intelligence against that data and loading in their electronic health records uh, to do that. And um, they're, you know, generating uh, anticipated uh, improvements and, and and when I say anticipated, it doesn't mean they haven't recognized it. That's their target metric is is improve patient outcomes. In other words, um, create algorithms that say patient A is getting this kind of treatment, has these types of physical characteristics. You probably should do some other type of 
uh, protocol with that patient before a doctor even figures that out. Um, and then, of course, that reduces costs because there's a lot. It, uh, uh, we do a, a good bit of healthcare work, and um, if you're not in the industry, when you start to get to the decision sooner about care, you eliminate a lot of testing and a lot of cycles and a lot of patient discomfort and and you don't occupy beds that shouldn't be occupied, et cetera. It really, really works into an enormous set of uh, benefits uh, for that. And so here's another example where they're targeting really significant uh, improvements in patient care. And they are achieving them for sure, but they're looking for really, really big, big numbers. So Kelly, I'll turn that over to you and let you uh, weigh in here. Yeah, I think that this is a great example of taking a look at the available architecture, the available data capability, and blending it with some new capabilities like artificial intelligence to be able to create a path and a plan from legacy to ultimately something that is more cutting edge. And I think that that's one of the things that we want to, and that we'll, you'll probably hear us talking about quite a bit. We've got a comment about it in the lessons learned section. But realistically, companies can't start at a sophisticated data science level because if they've been in business for more than 20 years, they have something that is now considered legacy. And it's virtually impossible to jump into that new uh, capability without considering how to transition from a previous architecture with certain capacities and limitations to that new architecture and demand. And so one of the things that we see that works quite well is when an organization such as this one starts to blend that legacy capability with some of the new components that are available to you as ways to consume and view that data. So a lot of work is done to make sure that the patient records are uh, correct, optimized, and available, and then leveraging that using some of the new technologies via artificial intelligence and other sort of front-end analytical tools can help blend a legacy architecture with a new architecture. So what I want, the other thing I wanted to say is we have another client that's, that's very much uh, an, exa an exaggerated example of this, where the company's over 100 years old. As you can imagine, their systems were cutting edge in the 70s. They still use some of them. <laughs> it's virtually impossible to completely sunset some of them. But at the same time, they have a head of strategy, they have a data science organization, and they have a group of people who are on that cutting edge and that bleeding edge. And so what has ended up happening is kind of an abyss between the legacy data and the desire to use that legacy data in a um, forward-thinking way. And so what's ending up happening is the recreation and the um, spawning of multiple new data stores in, in this instance, almost an exaggerated way because it's possible now with the new technologies. You can create a click view data store in a, you know, in, <laughs> in a day, right, in, in a nanosecond. And so you end up with this proliferation of data stores that doesn't necessarily help to get to the concept of data insight. What ends up doing is you have a, a great sandbox, but then when you go to productionalize it and try and really institutionalize that learning, it, it makes it very difficult. And so I wanted to just provide another use case of the blending or the challenge that can come up when legacy systems are not incorporated into the plan when looking at how do I take advantage of artificial intelligence, natural language processing, machine learning, et cetera, which is what we all want to get to from an analytics perspective. Cool, very, very, very good. Um, uh, we allowed uh, a lot of, uh, well, oh, the takeaway slide. I'm sorry, then it's time for Q&A. One more quick reminder here, some questions are coming in. I see one that just popped in, and there's a couple more here that I have uh, looked at and uh, we can uh, address. Um, 
Uh, but let's just kind of talk about what we would like you to take away from this. This is our initial uh, look at this uh, material. We're going to springboard from here and drive a lot deeper as the year goes on. Um, uh, if you're a technical person and you were uh, hoping for real, real depth, um, can start there, couldn't start there, have to build a foundation. Um, we will get there, uh, uh, don't worry. Um, and heck, I'm a propeller head at heart. Uh, we will certainly get down to those those types of things. Um, uh, but from, from this particular uh, presentation, um, kind of we're going to hit, yeah, there's the question right there. Reference architectures are just that. You may not need a lake. You may not need a, da a data warehouse or a sandbox. You might need a Acme Incorporated data store, whatever your company, you know, if you work for Cogswell Cogs, you might need a Cogswell Cogs uh, data store. Of course, uh, as anyone that recognizes that's as old as me. Um, then, uh, um, so, but, it's, you know, reference architectures are just that. You need to have that framework that you can talk to people about, and then you need to draw that architecture that the lines do flow the white lines you think they should flow and reflect kind of the things. But just please remember, there's not a right one or a wrong one. There's the one that's right for you. Um, because of that, we would like you all to not just cobble stuff together out there. When you start to buy or, or dive, or most of you probably have started already um, a lab. Although we do have, uh, uh, Kelly, we have clients that have tried this stuff. They've done a proof of concept of a big data, and they've handed it back politely to the vendor and said, nah, maybe next year. Um, but uh, um, just don't start to slap stuff together and then hope you're going to make it all interface somehow. Um, a lot of people can't. They discover that their pipes aren't big enough or, or, or what they want to do with the data. They just can't even physically do with the way their, their, their applications are built. So, so step away from the – every exercise in this area is an engineering exercise. It's not slap on a new thing. Um, uh, it'll really pay off in the long run. Um, manage that architecture with your needs and your usage versus what we have. Oh, we have a license for X, Y, and Z. Let's just, it's a hammer, let's make everything look like a nail. May or may not work in this predictive analytics world. It may work in this predictive analytics world, but it may, may not. And then lastly, I, I kind of dove into this earlier, web services. They're really an important tool. A lot of organizations are agile. You build a lot of services, um, and you don't build data layers. Uh, we'll talk that about this architectural characteristic later in the year as to some of the things to consider. Um, but but um, uh, uh, don't take those off the list just because you're, you're manhandling data and creating data lakes and, and things like that. So we have a few questions here. Kelly, anything to add to our takeaways? And then I'll start to uh, grind through the questions here. Yeah, I think just to reinforce the point that there is value to looking at a plan and understanding what the business usage is, the business goals you're trying to accomplish, and what it will take to get to those business goals and that business usage. And, you know, regardless of whether you are doing operational reporting, whether you're doing predictive analytics, whether you have a sophisticated data science group, scoping that data science project, scoping that capacity and those business goals and understanding the constraints within your technology, within your network, as you just said, John, uh, within your business um, understanding is important to the success of the project. And there's lots of different stories around uh, when people were first experimenting with big data where it failed. I remember maybe not so much last year, but in 2015, you know, big data is failing, big data is failing. Well, it's because they thought that it was a um, silver bullet that solved a lot of the problems that came up with, you know, quote unquote legacy technologies. And I think now that we're, we're understanding that it's not a silver bullet, we're applying some of those previous capabilities around uh, understanding of requirements, um, addressing and understanding constraints, and evaluating new technical capabilities to solve problems. And the good news is, is technology is also innovating to a point in which there are so many different solutions out there that are enabling organizations to link legacy systems 
through to these new analytic capabilities um, that's helping to bridge that gap. So I think that would be a key takeaway is remember those capabilities that you have within your organization around planning, scoping that apply regardless of the technology that you're using and to take advantage of that. Okay, uh, Kelly, stay, don't mute. Um, we got a few questions to grind through here. Um, first one uh, to talk about is any place to find out more specifics about what was done in the healthcare space? Yes, if you reach out through Shannon, she'll work to me and we'll, 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 we will make a connection and uh, uh, we have to, you know, obviously be careful of, of um, confidential things and all of that, but if all the, if all the uh, ducks line up, we'll, we will, we can put the right people in the right contact uh, with, uh, with you there. We can take mm -hmm. care of that. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, uh, Kelly, you want to start this one and I can finish up. Uh, definitional point of view, how is a lake different from a warehouse? Um, uh, someone, and as the, the question continues here, I saw another term on information dams. Uh, <laughs> how is a dam uh, different from a lake? Um, well, uh, uh, Kelly, do you want to start that one or, or me or, you know, I'm, I've been talking a lot. Is the dam the expletive that's the response to the lake? <laughs> no, it's, it's, yeah. I'm it, teasing no, it's, you. I'm looking at, I'm looking at the question right now. Yeah. So, um, without, uh, giving away the next session, so this is a great lead in to our next webinar, which is talking about data lakes versus data warehouses. And uh, so I think the big difference um, is that there was the feeling that data warehouses were too structured and we need to be able to um, put uh, an unconstrained amount of data into a repository that will enable us to do all kinds of fun analysis. And I think that, that the constraint of the structure of a data warehouse is what the data lake responded to. So fundamentally, I think a, a lake is meant to be um, less structured. And I'm not talking about the data type being structured versus unstructured. I'm talking about the, uh, the repository that holds the information as whether it is structured in some sort of schema like a warehouse or whether it is just, you know, freely um, structured in, in kind of a, a file system sort of lake. So that is, I think, one of the big differences. Yeah. Uh, John, do you want to comment on that? Yeah, um, uh, and again, we'll get into this. That's our next session a month from now is, is grinding into those differences. Um, they, they, and they have different audiences now. Um, uh, you could say uh, philosophically, philosophically they're kind of the same. You know, put a bunch of stuff in somewhere and everyone can enjoy it. Um, but but there, there are there are some usage differences and obviously some structural differences. Um, but there are also some some distinct similarities and success factors and challenges that you need to deal with. We'll, uh, it sounds like I'm teasing a little bit for the next one, but you know, for example, um, a lake uh, as a as a metaphor, a lake has water in it. Um, if you want everyone to enjoy the lake, you're not going to fill it with polluted water, which you know we see a lot of that. So that's the thing. Uh, as for an information dam, there's also um, uh, uh, you know the the you know bo a dam bottles stuff up and holds it back. Um, so yeah, it, you can have a structure where you know you might want to use it. And then trickle it downstream mm -hmm. to 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 users. Um, uh, 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 sometimes I think people invent these things because they sound like they've invented something. Um, uh, again, I think this is more of the distribution and the storage, and it's the engineering behind it. Um, and, and you know, hey, a dam can be different from a lake or not different from a lake, right? Uh, uh, I mean, I I. I have a, a home on a lake that has a dam that created the lake. So I kind of think it's one and the same to me. Anyway, um, we can get to that uh, uh, in detail for sure. I, I do, there is a subtle difference, but it's almost a philosophical difference as to, as to your point of view. There's also the concept of data ponds. So you have, as you have lakes, you have ponds. As you have warehouses, we had marts. As we have uh, 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 staging areas or caches, we have dams. I, you know, um, it could, it, there's that there, there's that going on. Uh, so um, there is a subtle difference, um, but it's, I think it's from a distribution standpoint and a management standpoint more than anything uh, on that one. 
Um, uh, Kelly, anything to weigh on at it? And I have actually uh, two more short ones here that we can we can we can address. Nope, that'd be great. Go, let's go to the other two. All right. Um, I uh, 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 mentioned the big difference in technology, uh, I, and I did that. I mentioned that you know there's a lot of cool things happening now. You talk about AI and all of that. Um, uh, uh, um, is this is, is you know are the, the current this is kind of a two-part question, really. It's with all these big differences in technology, um, are we seeing um, uh, potential value from uh, you know getting our arms around you know new stuff? Um, is it that different? Is it that is it worth considering it just because it's that different? So that's the first part of the question. You want to take that one, Kelly? Absolutely. Uh... Yeah, I mean, I would absolutely consider it if your business case uh, demands you to look at your data in a different way. Technology is out there that enables us to do amazing things with it now. And, you know, when we used to think about uh, the way that data is, you know, in the old days prepared, it was, you know, cleansed and standardized and all of that. And now when we look at data preparation and more of kind of a big data world, that data preparation is taking advantage of things like natural language processing. It's taking advantage of machine learning. It's doing all of this stuff for us, right? And so that, I think, is a, is a huge value if you can match your um, business goals to that sort of automated preparation, which leads to uh, more automated analysis, and therefore your usage of that information can be more sophisticated and in more real time, right? So this is, this is the value of all of this, and I think that, that it's absolutely worthwhile taking a look at. Again, looking at what is your ability to, uh, what is your priority from an organizational perspective, and how do you implement it and consume it in a way that is meaningful? And maybe you have your own little sandbox of new tools and technologies. Many organizations are really taking advantage of an innovation team where they have their organizational sandbox where they're trying out a lot of these new ideas and then they're moving organizationally into a production environment. And I'm not talking just technology, I'm talking organizationally um, going from innovation outwards. So my viewpoint is absolutely take advantage of it. Yeah. But yeah. don't overspend uh, when you don't really know what the goal is. Right. Yeah. I think that's, that's the key. Just unless you're a really massive organization and can afford to just dabble, uh, you're going to have to put some type of uh, uh, thought on, on how, how deeply you dive into this. Um, and most companies have started it already. And, 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 uh, but uh, that, well, we answered our question. Um, the other one are, are the, the other second part and I'll start mm -hmm. it and then, um, we can uh, move towards the wrap up here. Mm -hmm. Uh, so quick answers on this one. Are traditional vendors, uh, adapting, and I, I think I think they are, and I think we're seeing that across the whole thing. You know, even um, data governance uh, 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 tools, which you say, well, what does that have to do with big data? They're actually doing big data specific things uh, to help support uh, analytics uh, and stuff like that. And your your heavy lift ETL vendors and data quality vendors, they're all wading in and 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 adapting to the new ideas and the, and the new things. Look, data is very, very valuable. The light bulb is going on, um, uh, um, and, and everyone is adapting. If you don't adapt, um, and you're not going to be around very, very long. Uh, Kelly, over to you, and then we can wrap up. Yeah, absolutely. Um, any of the uh, larger companies that provide either the data stores, the data movement, the data processing, or the data consumption, if they are not organically developing it, they will they will be acquiring it, right? And so that is the purpose of our startup environment here, you know, that we have. Uh, and when I say here, I'm not thinking of physically here in Silicon Valley, but all over. And our startup environment is what pushes the envelope and pulls along those legacy companies that may not be able to innovate quite as fast as new companies. So think about it as your innovation environment and then your uh, your Oracles, your IBMs acquire those companies. Uh, so uh, if they're not innovating and they're not acquiring, then they will be obsoleted. Yeah, 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 yeah. 
All righty. Uh, I think that wraps us up. We're at the top of the hour almost. Shannon, we can turn it back to you. And thank you, everybody, for your time. We had a nice crowd today. Thank you. Um, and we're looking forward to next month and the rest of the year. And thank you to you both um, for kicking off our brand new webinar series, Data Insights and Analytics. What a great start to the series. Really excited about it. And thanks to our attendees for being so engaged in everything we do. Just a reminder, I will be sending a follow-up email by end of day Monday with links to the slides, links to the recording of this presentation for everybody. And I hope everyone has a great day. Thank you.